uh, our Minister of State, Dr. Rajkumar Ranjanji, uh, Sherpa, Sri Amitabh Kant, Chief Coordinator, Sri Harshwadhan Singla, uh, Secretaries uh, present here, the Honorable Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, Excellencies, dear colleagues. Uh, let me say what a great pleasure it is to welcome you all here uh, as we uh, gather together to uh, really uh, celebrate and uh, appreciate the importance uh, of the African Union's permanent membership uh, of the G20. To truly understand that, I think it's important that we think back of the journey that India and Africa have gone together. This is not a new journey. It is something which, of course, it has its, its uh, beginnings in the recesses of history. Uh, but certainly, uh, from the 18th century, uh, I think uh, we were both uh, regions that were impacted by the advent of colonialism. Uh, and just as we struggled through that uh, in the 19th, uh, it was logical that the 20th century saw the uh, independence struggles, the independence outcomes actually fructify uh, as much in our part of the world as in Africa. I think in many ways, uh, our destinies were interconnected. They certainly impacted each other. Uh, we learned a lot from struggles in Africa, just as I'm sure what happened in India also influenced many African countries and societies. Now, I begin there because uh, it has always been a belief, uh, I would say almost a cardinal tenet of Indian foreign policy that our independence was not complete without the independence of Africa. Our development was not complete without the development of Africa. And our rise will only be full and firm when we also see the rise of Africa. So there is a certain, I would say, not only solidarity, not just uh, not shared interest, but something far deeper that it is actually in our realizations of our aspirations uh, and goals that the rebalancing of the world will happen. That when we speak about a multipolar world, for us a multipolar world will be multipolar when Africa is also one of the poles. And it is that background, it is that thinking which has really shaped Indian foreign policy over the years and particularly so the government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Excellencies, many of you would recall that very soon after he took office in 2014, uh, we held the IAFS3 summit here in 2015. Uh, it was the most ambitious of its uh, series. <coughs> and I mention it because despite the COVID, we have largely delivered on our commitments in the IFS, but also to seek your support, Excellencies, of the need to hold IAFS 4 uh, fairly soon. It has slipped for a variety of reasons, mm, and I certainly hope that in 2024, uh, we will find a way, uh, because uh, given the changes in the world, it is important that India and Africa develop a more contemporary agenda of cooperation. But other than the IFS 3 in 2015, uh, I think uh, as the Ambassador, High Commissioner of Nigeria reminded us, uh, Prime Minister Modi also articulated his commitment, his personal commitment during a visit to Africa in 2018, that the priorities of Africa are the priorities of India, that we would, we would be guided by what uh, are the interests of Africa, and we will certainly give in our own foreign policy a particular, a very special place to Africa. So what you saw at the G20 summit, uh, which 
the Sherpa, uh, uh, Mr. Kant referred to, was actually a, a, a fructifying of what was a long-held belief uh, and a very deep sentiment uh, in the country and especially personally in the mind of the Prime Minister. I would also uh, say, as someone who's been associated uh, with uh, the, particularly with the uh, foreign policy making in the last decade, that one of the uh, uh, directions of the Prime Minister was that our foreign policy should reflect what is our domestic policy. And that domestic policy is an appreciation of diversity and of pluralism, a particular focus on inclusiveness, a commitment to social justice, focusing on the vulnerable, uh, and ensuring that no one is left behind. And that is exactly the kind of thinking. These are actually the principles which have also been our foreign policy principles of the last decade. So when we say today that India would like to be a Vishwamitra, a friend of the world, a friend of the world just like we are seeking uh, within India, uh, we are seeking within India social justice, fairness, equity, uh, uh, access uh, for all, affordability. These are exactly the goals which also guide uh, our approach to international affairs. Now, we began our G20 with an exercise that I think made very clear uh, how we intend to approach the responsibility of the presidency. And that exercise was the Voice of the Global South Summit, uh, which was uh, held in January of this year. By doing the Voice of the Global South Summit, we very clearly signaled to the G20 that this is what we are going to make as the subject central for the duration of our presidency. And I think, again, it is uh, appropriate, it's very fitting, that as we conclude our presidency, uh, we once again uh, do so with the voice of the Global South Summit, uh, which, as you all know, Excellencies, is planned for November 17th. <coughs> uh, and uh, uh, the, our, our expectation is that uh, what has been achieved in the course of this year would really become a lasting uh, agenda of the G20 that the refocus on the real issues of the world, which we try to promote this year, will be carried forward into the Brazilian and thereafter into the South African presidencies. Now, when we uh, approached the G20, as I said, uh, there were three uh, broad strands in our thinking. One was, how to make the G20 agenda Africa-centric, global South-centric. Uh, so what should be the, uh, the deliberations? What should be the outcomes? Uh, how do we uh, do it in a much more meaningful way than in the past? The second was the, uh, uh, the permanent seat in the G20 for the African Union. Uh, again, Excellencies, you are all aware that uh, this is something which had been deliberated for many years. This was not the first G20 when it came up for discussion. Uh, but we were very determined that unlike previous G20s, this will not end with a discussion. That we, we were very clear we will have an outcome. Uh, and uh, if as G20 chair, we took that lead, very confident that once somebody determinedly takes that lead and puts it firmly before the international community, uh, it is something which is bound to happen, uh, and we were glad we were proved right. And the third, of course, was the uh, aspirations of Africa, that uh, it is not just the requirements of Africa which needed to be met, it is also uh, what Africa sees over the horizon, what it requires for its development in the uh, coming decades. So the combination of changing the, refocusing the agenda, ensuring AU admission, uh, and 
addressing, reflecting the aspirations of Africa, this were very, very central to what we were seeking to do. Now, as you could see in terms of the outcome, uh, I think uh, there is uh, really a very substantial uh, set of uh, uh, domains where the G20 was actually able to pro progress. I particularly highlight uh, the action plan for accelerating SDGs because I think all of us know today that thanks to the COVID, uh, SDG realization has fallen behind very, very sharply. Uh, and uh, this has been confirmed by reports of the UN, uh, by the stock taking which the UN did in September. Uh, and, and clearly, uh, if the G20, you know, uh, the, the SDGs will not recover uh, in their uh, timelines unless the G20 really puts its shoulder to the wheel uh, and, uh, uh, you know, gives it the support that it really deserves. The second is the Green Development Pact. Because here again, uh, we have all seen, uh, you know, COP after COP, uh, how promises are made, but also how promises are shorted. Uh, and it is, uh, again, important that an institution like the G20 fully commit itself uh, to uh, the realization of green development. The third is actually resourcing uh, uh, such ambitions, uh, because it is the resources that have been uh, the vulnerability, the weak point. Uh, if, if the world has not been able to progress, if Africa in particular has been let down, uh, part of it is because the resources were not made available. So uh, I particularly uh, compliment our colleagues from the finance track uh, because uh, in the meeting in October, uh, I think they have uh, tried very hard to uh, ensure that there is a serious attempt made to uh, make available the resources, you know, both for green growth uh, and for sustainable development realization. The fourth uh, is the digital public infrastructure. I think some of you also mentioned it. Uh, uh, though you all live in India, so you have seen the transformational uh, impact of the digital public infrastructure uh, on our daily lives. Uh, it is something. <coughs> uh, it is something which uh, we are uh, willing and able uh, to share, both as experience uh, and as capabilities uh, with our partners. Uh, and the fact that the G20 today recognizes the transformational role of the digital public infrastructure, I think, would give that effort a very big boost. Uh, and finally, uh, the G20's imprimatur on woman-led development, I think, is again uh, something we need to recognize because uh, gender divides, uh, as SDG has fallen behind, uh, gender divides have also got sharper. This too needs to be reversed and reversed very fast. Now, there were some particular issues, I believe, uh, at the G20 outcomes which are important for Africa. Uh, and I mentioned some of them. One is the uh, emphasis on reformed multilateralism, uh, because uh, here again, uh, you know, we all share the frustration uh, of lack of progress uh, in the negotiations, in the intergovernmental negotiations in the United Nations. Uh, but the fact that uh, if G20 again uh, uh, comes on board, uh, I, I think, and we've seen some progress in other uh, forums as well, including recently at a BRICS meeting that we had, uh, that uh, on the basis of the Isolveni consensus and the SIPTE declaration, how do we give Africa its due place in the highest councils of the world? Uh, I think this uh, is a matter of interest. And here again, uh, the G20's, uh, uh, G20's deliberations have been uh, to the advantage of Africa. The second uh, relates uh, to my mind, to food security. Uh, you, the last 2023 has been the International Year of Millets. And it is a campaign which we in India have taken great pride in promoting. It was something which the Prime Minister personally pushed. Uh, and each one of you, including at today's lunch, uh, I think are by now deeply familiar uh, with how uh, effectively and creatively and tastefully uh, millets can be uh, presented. Uh, 
But in my own travels in Africa, I've also been struck how deeply this is part of your tradition as much as it is of ours. Uh, and uh, as we struggle today with the uncertainties of uh, food accessibility and avail availability, uh, when we looked at the problems on wheat supply and rice supply that the world has seen even in the last few years. The stress on millets, uh, millet production can actually be a very big and bold and impactful step in global food security. So the, uh, the fact that the Deccan principles on food security were adopted, uh, I think was a very, very commendable step. Uh, a third uh, development I flag is of green hydrogen because green hydrogen is not just climate friendly. Uh, I think it can make a huge difference to the energy security uh, of developing countries. Uh, and uh, here again, I think there is the basis uh, for a common agenda between India and Africa. The fourth is health, very understandable in the aftermath of uh, COVID. So whether it is the expansion and I would say democratization of vaccine production uh, or uh, you know, pro the focus on antimicrobial resistance, uh, I think the G20 has done uh, the world uh, a signal service by stressing these issues. Uh, and we, of course, were also very glad that our presidency saw the first uh, uh, summit uh, on traditional medicine. Uh, it, is, it is something which is very deep uh, a part of our culture and heritage. Uh, so uh, I would like to flag to all of you, Excellencies, that it's an area where we should continue to uh, work together, uh, bearing in mind particularly that the WHO Global Center of Excellence uh, happens to be located in India. Uh, I also would like to mention the uh, fact that the G20 uh, did uh, show awareness on uh, issues relating to culture. Uh, culture uh, in terms of trafficking, illicit trafficking and cultural uh, property and restitution uh, of uh, uh, the products of such trafficking. I think this too is part of a more fair and uh, I would say just conversation uh, today between the developing world and the developed world. Now having spoken about G20, if you would permit me, uh, I take the opportunity to also assess where India and Africa stand today in our relationship. Our trade with Africa today is in excess of $100 billion. Uh, and it's actually fairly evenly balanced. <coughs> 27 uh, African LDC countries benefit from our duty-free tariff preferences. Uh, and our expectation is that this trade will easily double in the coming decade. Uh, it's not just trade. India is among the top five investors in Africa. Uh, our, cap our estimated capital today is in excess of $80 billion there. The bulk of our new embassies, I remind you, Excellencies, in the last decade have also opened in Africa. And not just embassies, the first Indian Institute of Technology opened in Africa, the first Indian Institute of Technology abroad opened in Africa, the first Forensic Sciences University abroad opened in Africa. So, uh, I don't need to stress to you today what is the importance that we attach, not just to our relationship, but to the promise of those ties, that we are actually betting on your future as well. And uh, we see in our relationship actually a very, very powerful force uh, that would uh, rebalance the global uh, polity, which in our view has been skewed uh, over the last two centuries. Uh, in terms of our development partnership, again, uh, we have always been very clear that we respond to the priorities of our partners. I'm glad to say that we've done actually more than 200 projects in Africa, uh, 208 to be precise, uh, and uh, many of these are quite notable in your particular countries. I myself had the privilege uh, of seeing uh, some of them. Uh, in fact, whenever I have gone on a visit, it's been my good fortune to uh, spend some time 
in one of the projects that we have recently done. Uh, and they, they are projects which have really made a difference to people's lives. Uh, that these are projects which have delivered on agriculture, on water, on energy, on, uh, on IT, uh, in, in terms of uh, governance. Uh, so uh, we're really proud of that. Uh, and uh, we have also continuously, and this is part of our history, uh, that uh, we have continuously contributed to capacity building in Africa. Uh, so uh, even uh, after IFS 3, I see that we have delivered on more than 30,000 scholarships. Uh, and when, whenever Africa has been in distress, our colleagues in Mozambique and, uh, and Madagascar would vouch for it particularly, or many of you during COVID as well, uh, that uh, we have tried our best to respond through HADR operations. The period of the COVID was particularly testing. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that we were uh, not only able to contribute uh, through COVAX, uh, but also in many cases to do so uh, bilaterally uh, uh, through, uh, uh, through vaccine supplies uh, from India. So uh, I believe today that what uh, has happened at the G20 is one step a very important step, but one step on what is a larger partnership which has been unfolding uh, and which has gathered pace uh, in the last decade. As I look ahead next year, 2024, we will have the NAM summit in Africa. We will have the G77 summit in Africa. Uh, India and Africa must work together very closely in the summit for the future because I think as the youngest demographies of the world, we have the most at stake when it comes uh, to the future. It's important that we press uh, the issue of uh, uh, the SDG Agenda 2030 together, uh, that we, we also coordinate strongly on UN reform, uh, and that we actually strive to make this a world which is much more sensitive uh, to the global south. So I, I uh, thank you once again for joining me this afternoon. Uh, and uh, I want to say that you know, uh, your expectations were a great sense, a great source of, uh, for us of energy and motivation. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we really uh, take pride in the fact that in many ways the Indian G20 presidency would be, re would be remembered uh, as the Sherpa said, uh, will be remembered for the India-Africa contribution uh, that it has made. And finally, uh, uh, as you know, uh, we are approaching the festival of Deepavali. Uh, it, is, it is the biggest festival of this country. So I, of course, convey my <coughs> good wishes to all of you. But I do want to share with you that uh, we are uh, inter we are inviting all heads of missions uh, to uh, visit Ayodhya uh, on November 11th on Deepavali Day for what is called the Deepotsav. Uh, and uh, two weeks later on November 27th, uh, we intend to organize a trip to Varanasi for the Dev Deepavali uh, celebrations. So I hope that uh, most of you will be able to join us uh, on that occasion. Once again, let me say what a delight it is to meet you all. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I thank you for all that you do every day in your work to promote our relationship. Thank you. Thank you, sir.